It's great to see you all here um, and uh, welcome. Uh, I'm going to, we're, as you know, we're talking about writing through the climate change. So it's, um, I'm delighted to be here with this amazing panel who I'm going to get to introduce themselves to you all. And then we'll have a, we'll have a chat. Uh, I have a few <coughs> questions. And then we will have questions from you as well um, later on, uh, about halfway through, I think. Um, or about 20, 25 minutes, 20 minutes in, we will um, let you ask questions. So hold on to your questions as they come up, make a note, and uh, look forward to hearing them. So, um, shall we start with you, Emily, at the end? <laughs> okay. This is Emily. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Can everybody hear me all right? Um, I'm Emily Oldfield. I went to MMU. I was an English um, undergraduate student, and... Um, I'm a poet. Um, my collection, Grit, was published just before lockdown. So that feels like a really strange like, time ago. And um, since then, I've written um, a collection about uh, the Calder Valley, where I live now. So like uh, the area around Tomadin and what's happening to the landscape around there, like historically. And um, I'm also working on a book of creative nonfiction called Scraps, which is a walking journey through the food, culture and history of the northwest of England. Hi everyone, um, my name is Nicola Penfold and I write for children and um, kind of young adults. So the age range of my books is um, kind of, it's halfway between middle grade, which is traditionally nine to 12, and then young adult, which is, um, yeah, kind of 14 plus. So I kind of write for 10 to 15 year olds. My books are climate fiction, I think I could say. They're very inspired, they, they use nature. Um, setting is really important to me, but I'm really looking at a changed world and also looking at natural solutions to, the, uh, to climate change um, and the biodiversity crisis, which we know is a big thing alongside the climate crisis. My first book was called Where the World Turns Wild, and this came similar to yours, Emily. It came out at the start of the pandemic, and it was actually about a virus. So my story was about a virus that separated people from the natural world. Um, in my story, the virus was carried by ticks, and people had to live in cities and shut nature out um, in order to survive. So I really explore um, the importance of, of the natural world in our life, the importance of connections with nature and um, specifically addressing young people um, and trying to forge those connections for um, our children. Hi everyone, um, lovely to see you all here and I'm thrilled to be here today. Um, I'm, all, I'm a nature writer and author of the book I Belong Here, A Journey Along the Backbone of Britain, which is a nature writing book about my walk on the Pennine Way. I've also been in anthologies including Women on Nature, Common People, um, the Wild Isles and a new anthology that's actually just been published this month called North Country, a collection of northern nature writing and um, Manchester's my hometown. So it's lovely to actually do an event in Manchester <laughs> instead of having to get the train to London. So. Yeah, it's always nice to have events up in Manchester instead of London. Yeah. Um, I'm also, um, um, I write just a little bit about myself. I write, I started as a poet I'm, and, and um, I'm also a scriptwriter. I do a lot of drama, um, and um, I write a lot about food, which of course is now a huge climate emergency as well. And some of the things I've been doing more recently with food is that I've been uh, adapting cookbooks, my favorite cookbooks, to drama series. For they've been on Radio Four, uh, which has been a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, so it's really it's amazing. What a great panel we have. So one of the questions I wanted to start with was really what does it mean to be a writer today, you know, in light of climate and ecological emergency? And, you know, we've been through COVID recently as well. So um, who would like to start? I don't want to pick up anything. Any, any, anybody wants to jump in to say anything about that? What, what, how is it to be a writer at the moment? Um, I can start. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think as writers, we've got a really important role to play. I think it's hard to write today, especially if you're writing about nature, um, I'm sure you'll agree, Anita, and not address in some way the climate crisis. I, I tackle it quite head on in my books. So I don't think you have to do that. 
Um, ben Okri wrote this article for The Guardian about a year ago um, around COP26, and he said something about, I'm paraphrasing him, but we must write as if these are the last days. And he talked about writing's role to cut through the apathy and the denial because we're bombarded every time we switch on the radio, every time we watch TV. There are reports all the time and we just ignore them. We tune them out. We just, it's white noise. We don't listen to it because it's too frightening. I think storytelling and poetry and words have such a special role in, in cutting through that, in, in really speaking to us. And we can use our voices in ways to reach people to kind of um, to encourage action um, and I yeah that's something that I'm very mindful of when I write I'm hoping that I am encouraging people to think about these issues because they're you know we're hurtling I think Ben Ockery said in that article um, we're on a ship heading towards an abyss and the party on board is just getting louder and louder and um, yeah that's what I want to cut through that party there are like brilliant points here. It's like that kind of cutting through. I think we we live in a society now where there's so many layers, you know, there's so much, there's like an oversaturation of information and we've become so far removed, you know, from the reality of the world we are in, in many ways, you know, there's so much technology, there's so many stories, there's so many accounts of, you know, of what reality is. And I see writing as a kind of excavation. It's kind of, or, or I try to anyway, get back into looking at those processes that sustain us. We've become so far removed from them, especially like in terms of food. When you think about supermarkets and you can order food online, you know, we were so far like separated from the, our actual impact on the natural world in, in many respects that I think a role of writing can be to unpick that relationship and to bring us closer to our, not only to ourselves, but to the, you know, the planet that we're part of. And um, because, yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to express and articulate, you know, that impact. And, but through writing, it can be, I suppose, encouraging people to think about their own, like, personal responsibility and not just like, not just public acts, but like their own self. And I think writing is a reflective, you know, vehicle for that. Thank you. Yeah, just to um, reiterate, what the other speakers have said and also as a nature writer the climate crisis is at the heart of what I write about is absolutely inescapable and that's because you know far too often we think about the climate as being something separate from us like this kind of like buzzword in the newspapers oh the climate crisis but actually it's so important to remember that you know we are part of nature we are the, the climate and the environment we are inextricably linked to that and um, it's affecting us and we are affecting it. So that relationship is absolutely crucial and impossible to ignore. And that's what I'm, I'm interested in writing about, how we are not apart from nature, we are a part of nature. You know, the air we breathe, it, you know, it's the oxygen that fills our lungs. Yeah. We are nature. And um, also, you know, as writers, we are, we're always observing, aren't we? Whatever genre we're writing in, whether it's non-fiction narrative, non-fiction nature writing, or whether it's fiction. And you can't go for a walk down the streets without failing to notice the complete disruption in the climate. Just how unseasonable it, things are getting, how unseasonably warm it's, it, it can be, um, you know, the flowers that shouldn't quite are beautiful but shouldn't quite be there at this time of year um, i've just been i'm doing a, se um, a series of uh, nature writing workshops themes around the seasons and we can celebrate the beauty of the natural world at the same time as mourning how disrupted it is because of the climate crisis mm -hmm. so i think it's it's um it's so important that we um, speak out about it and also that we care about it because nature in turn cares for us as well yeah great some amazing points there from all of you. Thank you so much. What, I, what would be really good, I think, is to know how you all got started. You know, for me, when I started writing about food was when, I, when we had the Commonwealth Games here in Manchester and uh, Lowry were looking for writers in residence, uh, artists in residence, and one of them was a writer. But we had to pitch what we were going to write about, and that's when I pitched food. And so I wasn't really thinking about we didn't really have such a serious case of climate at the time, which was in 2002. But it turned out that it was something I was going to 
carry on writing about and now I even grow all my own food and a lot of my own food in the allotment and things so and it really has made me think about climate and and so I thought with with the way you know you're all here a lot of you might be starting out how did you all start out did, was it um, I feel like mine was almost an accident I was very passionate about food and it's been natural to write about it and then to grow it and to then look around as I've got involved with nature, how serious the crisis is at the moment. So um, can you remember what got you started? As a writer, yeah. I started off actually writing for newspapers and magazines. Yeah. So, and that's a really, actually a really exciting way to explore your voice. Yeah. And then well, the first creative of, writing sorry. that I, um, I had a piece published in the Seasons Nature Writing oh, Anthology, okay. which yeah. is actually, Mine was, uh, it's quite relevant to this season, it's winter and it, it was about um, my childhood garden growing up in an area that you live in. I grew up on Seymour Grove, Ayers oh, Road, right. the corner house there. <laughs> and um, I'm very interested in urban nature yeah. and it's really a celebration of urban nature and learning to pay attention to, you know, the, the hope that comes from planting a bulb in the, mm -hmm. and then watching it bloom in the garden in an inner city. And that gave me the confidence being in anthologies to build up and um, recognize that my voice also belongs here because mm -hmm. uh, for people from certain backgrounds can be made to feel by the industry that we don't belong here so ironically my first book is called I belong here <laughs> yeah fantastic thank you thank you very much I think in the beginning I sort of always wanted to be a writer from being very little and I was just looking for a story I was just looking for a story to tell and I, I always worried that I just wouldn't have the ideas I felt like I could write well but I didn't have the ideas and then I, I had children of my own and I was reading with them and just a few things seemed to happen. I, I think I was really conscious as a parent that how I wanted to get my kids out into nature. Um, I read this book, this non-fiction book called Last Child in the Woods by an American writer called Richard Louvre. And he was the person that coined the term nature deficit disorder. And he talked about how we're raising the first generation of children to grow up without a meaningful um, connection with nature and the damage that that could do. Um, and this really scared me, it really frightened me. So I really came at my story um, partly from that. Um, and there was something about that title, Last Child in the Woods, that really triggered this idea. And then it felt like it was almost, my first book was almost delivered to me. And it became, I had this city where no nature was allowed. And it became a journey up to the Lake District, which was a place that I loved. And I visited it a lot as a child. My grandparents lived nearby in Carlisle. Um, it was a really happy place for me and a place I'd started to take my own children. So it became quite a personal journey back to those, um, to that place that I really loved. Um, and yeah, it just seemed to be about what I was reading at the time. It felt, there was a book, um, I'm sure some of you know it, called The Lost Words by Robert McFarlane. Um, I'm sure you, lots of you know him and Jackie Morris, this amazing artist. And some words, some nature words had been taken out of the Oxford Junior Dictionary and they were really alarmed by this and they made this book, The Lost Words, which is beautiful for children, but lots of adults have read it too and it's a celebration of some of these nature words um, and that really inspired me too. I think there was lots going on and now I think we're all aware of the importance of nature, but, but still um, we need to yeah, still forge those connections and make sure that they're for everyone. I think that's still something where we've got a long way to go on. I think I started out in, I've always been interested in the overlooked aspects of the local. I think if we focus on a local level, it can be quite empowering for the individual. And I grew up in um, Bacup, which is a, a like a small mill town in East Lancashire. And it often evaded a lot of the kind of cultural funding. It was very kind of isolated growing up on the kind of West Yorkshire, East Lancashire border. It's like kind of a border town. and. Um, yeah, it's like surrounded by beautiful, well, arguably beautiful kind of like hillside, you know, like scenery, um, but also like the remnants of industry. And there's such like a disconnect in the land. And um, I'd always wanted to like write about that and write about those tensions because we can describe, say, um, we describe a lot of aspects of the landscape as beautiful, like I just did then. But um, it's, a, it's a beauty that's tarnished and um, a lot of kind of, perhaps now old fashioned like literary language is describing like an idealized version of the landscape that's been layered on by ruin and by, you know, and by industry, but obviously those industries have sustained communities. So it's also complicated. 
And then I came to Manchester Met as a student and I did um, a module called Writing and Place with um, Dr. David Cooper. And um, through reading the texts on there, it not only helped like, in, like empower me with a sense of I can do this too, but actually I can write about these areas where, you know, where, where, where I've came from. And um, that complexity and those kind, that layering of humanity and landscape um, deserves to be deserves to be written about and it isn't just as easy as saying we should remove industry in order to allow nature because it's, it's like placing things in separation and I'm interested in how we can obviously reflect on what has already happened to the landscapes around us and perhaps on a local level come to um, some kind of movement forward rather than looking backwards and resenting ourselves. That's so nice to just hear how everybody's got started and especially when you were mentioning the area we both mm. uh, we've just yeah. discovered we live in the same area mm. and and I I mean <coughs> we are really blessed where we live because we have like two parks like uh, you know uh, uh, you which, which are literally on our doorsteps and they are magical to walk through aren't they and then yeah. and then you know when you were talking I was thinking of all of you actually I was thinking about how we might have taken it for granted the nature, nature we talk write about and we are inspired by, like in my allotment, even though I've had it for a few years, when I, when I sow things, you know, I now I make my own seeds and, and it's like magic. You put a seed in the ground, and then there's like tomatoes and chilies and aubergines. I mean, it's unbelievable. And peppers. I've been growing peppers, and will that magic stop? You know, I take it for granted at the moment, but there's loads of nature. If we look back in our lives, you know, there were things we took for granted. Um, like you were saying about how um, you just have to walk down the street and everything has changed. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it, I wonder if, um, if you think, does it mean that ev all writing now is going to become climate writing? Are we all going to be thinking about that and writing about that? It's a question I've heard again and again, listening to radio, watching TV, reading, so it'd be interesting to see if, if um, you know, if you have any thoughts on that. And anyone, Emily, would you like to start? Thank you. I mean, we're all part of this world, aren't we? So it's yeah. like you can't not reflect on the, or we're all affected by the processes, you know, and um, of like what is happening to our environment. And um, as you mentioned earlier, Anjum, I think food is a big, you know, route for that because we're sustaining ourselves we're part of so many links and chains and processes that we've become so far removed from the origin of, let's say, with food. You know, if you go to the supermarket, you're not necessarily going to know where, you know, the this pre-baked like pie or even the loaf of bread is from. And um, it's but in even just in writing about food in writing about like sustaining ourselves as writing about human beings, we're writing about people who are experiencing like great changes around them and like a re such a high degree of kind of separation from yeah from what it takes to be ourselves I think and that's quite alien and that's quite frightening you know and that it well it ties into climate change so heavily because we've become so divorced from the place that we wake up in you know every day and um, I guess with writing like the non-fiction that I'm working on at the moment it's revisiting the kind of local foods of an area historically to see not only the stories behind them, but in perhaps in, in opening up some of those old kind of methods of farming and working the land and eating on, you know, according to the land, I live in an area with very peaty, acidic soil, so only it's very difficult to make arable. But um, it's been, in seeing what's possible on a smaller scale, it, we can empower, you know, the individuals to, you know, to be more proactive in, on, in a, as part of a public campaign for, you know, improved awareness of climate change. So I think it's inherent in all our lives and all the literature that comes out from, you know, is, is just affected by this world. So we can't not reflect on it, even if it's not explicit. I wouldn't explicitly call myself a climate writer, but it's, it permeates everything that I write. I, I, yeah, I agree with so much of that and what all of it. Um, I, I mean, my books tackle climate change head on. Not all books have to do that. And actually, I think 
if they all did, would quickly reach the point of saturation. And I th I'm writing for young people and I'm very aware of, um, you know, we can all despair. It, it can be really scary. It can be really dark and, um, and hard to think about. And um, I think hope is really important when you write, especially for young people. But I think adults need it, need it too. I think um, it's really important that we cling on to some of the, the solutions we have and actually writing about nature or a place um, actually, nature is one of the biggest solutions to climate change we have. And, and I've, I really try to focus on natural solutions to climate change. So in my last book, I talk quite a lot about whales. It's set in the Arctic and I talk about how whales are this amazing um, natural solution to climate change. And if we hadn't hunted whales to such low numbers, then we you know we'd be in a better place than we are now. And one whale is meant to be worth like thousands of trees in terms of carbon capture. Um, so I think it's it's finding your way. It's it's I think if you layer it on too thickly, then that can turn readers away. And you know we need lots of other kinds of stories as well. We're always going to need loads of different kinds of stories. But yeah, it's hard to, especially if you're writing about plays or nature, it's hard to write without in some way addressing climate change and the biodiversity crisis. And if we do, if we didn't, I think we risk being um, irrelevant, but also you know a little bit irresponsible. Thank you. And I just wanted to pick up on a word um, there, um, which I think is really important, and that's hope. So when I began my journey along the backbone of Britain, I actually began in a place called Hope, which is in the Peak District. And I began um, the summer after I had been racially abused and told that I don't belong here. And I think a, bit, a little bit later, we're going to talk about climate crisis and intersectional issues. Um, but yeah, and I began in a place called Hope, which I'm sure a lot of you know, you can get that. It's, Edale, and that's the beginning of the Pennine Way, but it's also um, the, the beginning at the heart of the Peak Districts, mm -hmm. which is our first national park. And it was fascinating to like learn about how, you know, restoration initiatives and uh, how climate change and the climate crisis is affecting the landscape and how, what humans are doing to mitigate against that, how thousands of sphagnum moss plants, for example, have been planted. Mm -hmm. Um, which can hold 20 times their weight in water, for example, and, you know, replanting of trees and um, learning more about that and becoming close to that will, you know, helps us to appreciate nature more. So I think hope is incredibly important. And well, for me, um, I can't, you know, the climate crisis is I inextricable in my work. So yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I totally agree, because if you think about it, like if you're, if any of you are writing scripts, for example, you know, you have to have a heading and you say whether it's indoors, interior or exterior, then you say where it is and, and you mention the weather. There's, you know, if it's outside, especially like the weather is there in novels, it's there in plays always, you know, that we, we couldn't write without it. So it's an interesting question that whether we can, you know, whether whether all writing is climate writing and I think it is if we even if we look back long way back you'll notice you know um, in um, in every literature there is always weather plays a big big part it's like um, so I don't know maybe that leads me on to the next question which is do you think writing for climate is a, a, a like a, a literary or a, a genre uh, should, could it be defined as such or is it part of what we do anyway? The, you know, these are some of the questions which are coming up now. It's like place writing, for example. You know, I, uh, when I heard the first time about place writing, I thought, well, everything's in a place. How can you have place writing? So maybe it's the same question I'm asking now is, do you think that um, um, it is a genre? You're nodding. Well, there's an, there's an interesting <laughs> term. Um, which some of you might have heard of. If you haven't, you've heard of it now. Cli-fi, has anyone heard of it? No, I haven't heard of it. Cli-fi, so <laughs> that's, that's the short for <laughs> climate fiction. Yeah. So right. I think that's, only, only recently have I heard that term, cli-fi. Yeah. Um, so obviously, you know, it's putting out sci-fi. So cli-fi is, you know, this uh, apolo apo Apocalyptic. Can you say it for me? I can't. Really apocalyptic. Say it. I have the same problem. Like sci-fi. <laughs> apocalyptic. Um, apocalyptic. Uh, end of the world fiction. Cli-fi fiction. And um, you know, you think of Margaret Atwood's yeah, trilogy, yeah. and um, 
more and more books like that are coming up. So it is very interesting, isn't it? How yeah, yeah. new genres emerge like this place writing, nature writing, and now what's called climate fiction or cli-fi. Yeah. So. Very good. I've, yeah. I've learned something new today. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, I really like that term climate <laughs> fiction. And um, good because it's interesting because when my books first came out, um, I suppose I would have described them as um, speculative fiction or dystopian fiction. Um, some people call them science fiction. Some people might even say fantasy, although I don't think my books are fantasy. But it's funny that all these genres, um, then if you, if you think about climate fiction, it's, it becomes increasingly like our own world, which is really scary. Um, and yeah, I think climate fiction uh, or writing about, you know, writing about climate change, it can apply across lots of different genres rather than being a genre in itself. But it's, it's, it's hard to to pin that down and um, I on the train up I came up from London and I, I'm reading a book that was written I think it 19 in the early 1990s by a writer called Oct Octavia or Octavia Butler she grew up in um, America and that's very much I think that's definitely climate fiction and but I think that term was actually coined in the early 2000s so it's not been around that long and some people go back and look at books like um, Drowned World by Jules Verne yeah. but that's not the climate has changed in that book but it wasn't humans that changed the climate so I think there's something very specific about our time and the time we're living through where we're writing um, we're writing works about humans impact on the environment um, so I, I think climate fiction is a really useful term. Yeah. I think it is a, a useful term, but like, as you say, it probably can apply across yeah. genres rather than being like a genre in itself. Because if you start setting the category of like a genre in itself, does it imply that it should be prescriptive and like people should respond to it in a particular way? Is it illuminating what is happening, you know, perhaps beyond our immediate awareness? It's hard with like, say, if you have a category, what's the outcome of that category, you know, that, of that genre? Is it that it should get people to act in a certain way? Or is it the in, that the individual feels empowered to think more about their everyday decisions and their impact, um, impact on the world? Um, so it is interesting. And I think language can sometimes be a little bit unhelpful. And perhaps one of the tasks of writers is to be constantly questioning like the limits of language. Um, like I was saying earlier, in terms of like, a lot of the language we use to describe the landscape has be, been layered with like romantic romanticization you know for years like the beautiful rolling hills and the even like the rugged pennines and which is seen as just almost like a bit of a throwaway comment and yet there are layers of damage and layers of you know like yeah. complexity there that i think as writers we're always you know having to like snake beyond like the confines of language as we see it because we've pushed our planet beyond the confines of you know what we expected of it and it's surprising us all the time because we've We've caused a lot of damage, you know, and um, so it's it's really it's really difficult to get the language to describe that, and I think everybody's working it out in a way. It's amazing to hear some of the points. I I was also I don't know how many of are, are there many climate writers in here. Do you want to put your hands up? Yeah, that's like a reluctant. It's okay if you are, are interested in writing for climate. Yeah. Okay, great. So because I was going to ask a question, which was that um, um, I wonder what our panel would give as advice to you all if you were thinking about writing for climate, about climate change or, or about the climate or about nature in itself. Uh, do, do they have any advice or any ideas which to get you started or if you're already writing, how you might go about it? Do we do we think per, you know? Do you, are you going to think specifically about whether I'm, I'm going to whether I meant uh, you know if if you want to write about climate, do you start with that or do you how? For example, when I write, I don't think about it, but obviously food is related to everything we do as human beings and to Earth. So how what would your advice be to people here, to the people attending at the moment? Emily, you look keen to go. <laughs> it sounds like, because um, when you say climate, people think, oh, should I write about the weather? Should I write about the landscape? But I think with me, writing always, as a person, writing always started with people, you know, as much as I can feel removed from people a lot of the time, and I live, like, I live on my own, and I spend a lot of time on my own. But it was like through, 
and like I was walk, you know, I live on the edge of the moorlands in um, in West Yorkshire, and like kind of walking out on the moorlands, I was thinking, how far do I have to think back for this to be without people? But like field systems and you know roads and you know like trackways through and the clearing of forests, it's all human impact on the land. It's almost like po um, we almost like we unsee a lot. I think that interests me. Um, you know, we, we take pylons and um, things like that as we kind of see them as part of the landscape mill chimneys and it's strange how that's kind of happened. So I think to write about the climate, you have to write about the human because we've, because the climate, you know, it, we're, it's all like human language and human description. And I think starting from how you see people acting or how people's impact in the land and the place that they're part of, I think that's where, where I started anyway. I, I think um, it's really important if you're writing about the climate to, I think you can be too preachy and you can be too, um, and it becomes a sermon and, and people switch off from it. I think you've got to still keep your story or what you want to say at the heart of it and your voice and all those other things that we know as writers that we need to achieve. Um, I think for me, um, it's finding, even if you're writing about quite a bleak, place and really altered landscape I think finding the beauty is still really important I know you talked quite a lot about beauty and it can come in strange places um, but focusing on that because that's what's going to keep your reader reading that's what's going to you know that's like the oxygen in the book that's going to want they want you want to create you want to write about a place where your reader will want to spend time if it's if it's too damaged and there's nothing there that's good then that's quite a difficult book to read. So yeah, I think finding the beauty is really important. I loved what you were saying about growing vegetables and the magic and these things that we take for granted. You know, beauty can be in the, it can be something really simple that you can be like a daily thing that you see and you, you can look at it anew in your writing and, and see, this is amazing, this is magic. Yeah, I think it's so important to see the beauty and show the beauty, but I also think that it's, really dangerous to like romanticize or overly romanticize places and it's really important to be um, honest about the damage you know like I love going for walks on the Manchester Canal yeah. but you know if I wrote like just a romanticized piece about the wonders of nature walking near the canal and ignored the litter in the canal and the beer bottles and the crisp packets just because I did I wanted to make the re that's not honest so I think um my advice, one of my top pieces of advice is pay attention, mm. pay attention. So use your eyes, pay attention, say what you see and use your heart as well. Use your eyes, your heart, use all the senses, use your ears and say what you see. But you know, I think being honest is really, import is really important and not over romanticizing or editing out the ugliness from your picture because you know, we're not, I, I think we need to be really honest about it and not overly romanticised. And that's, you know, and there's a whole, there are long essays on this and books about the pastoral depiction of nature and um, so on, which just wants to show beautiful rolling hills or, and, <laughs> but you know, we're talking, this panel is about the climate crisis and that's damaging the beauty. And I think that's so important to remember on a panel like this and in, you know, every day, so yeah. yeah. Well, as you can see, you know, um, we're all four different writers and we have different views about where you can start, how you can start, what might help you. And I think that's one of the biggest things about writing, that it can be anyone. You, you, know, you, can, be, you can write in any way you want. And uh, it's capturing the audience and their, point, their attention, really. But you know, you can, it's nice to be different. Everything is right. So it's been, it's been pretty awesome. I think it's time to open up to you all to see if you have any questions. Whenever you bring up climate change and climate crisis, there's always the anxiety of, of the overwhelming um, like nature of, of climate change and like the historic baggage of how much we've stripped the, the earth and also the, like from my generation, there's um, like an anger towards the older generations, like not just the older generations that are alive today, like previous ones to how they let all of this happen how can we navigate or express creatively that anxiety anger and things like that without that sense of doom that's a really really good point and i'm so glad that you flagged up those emotions um anger and anxiety because 
they're so valid and it's important not to have those emotions invalidated and I think it's really important to put those emotions on the page if you're feeling rage put it on put your rage on the page and also remember the crucial thing is that rage and anger can it's an energy and it's about directing that energy harnessing that energy because you can either let anger consume you and feel as you say resentful for the people the past generations and what people are doing or you can channel it like a fuel like in the northern term it's all grist to the mill so um, that can be you know turn anger into activism and writing is a form of activism mm -hmm. and you can use that as your fuel you know the ink in your pen and you can write something searingly passionate and angry but then as well as looking back to what people have done and looking at how people are destroyed you can look forward and that's where you get hope from you can know that you can look forward and know that your actions now are impacting the world as it will become. And that gives you optimism and hope. But I think it's very important to acknowledge the anger. Yeah, it's completely valid. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with everything you said. I think there, I think if you're writing about the climate and also the, you know, the, the loss of nature, um, you know, we're angry and, you know, I write for young people, they're inheriting this place and, and there's been a, a, you know, Greta Thunberg came onto the stage and she's amazing and she was so young and she, she inspired so much hope but she's, she was, when she started she was just a child, not just a child, that's completely the wrong thing to say, but she was so young and I feel, it makes me angry, it makes me, it, sometimes it feels like we're waiting for the next generation to solve these problems and we have to, we have to acknowledge what we've done and um, what previous generations have done. In my second book, um, it's set in the future and, and sea levels have risen and lots of resources have, have really shrunk. Um, and my characters talk about the greedy years and that's kind of talking about um, as now and, 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 and you know, a few years ago. Um, yeah, I think there's a big place for anger. I don't think there's any getting away from it. Um, but yeah, looking forward, um, thinking what we can do on an individual level. And also I think um, we, we put so much on um, individuals and, and um, personal actions, which is totally true, but I think we have to really challenge um, governments around the world and the big businesses. There's so much corporate greed. Um, and yeah, I think that's where a lot of the anger should be directed. Yeah, both like really excellent, you know, like points about kind of turning the anger into activism and, um, you know, we have a right to feel angry and, um, but it's um, a lot about kind of, we have also feelings of like perhaps blame and shame and guilt and they're all really difficult, difficult feelings, but they're not proactive and not necessarily looking forward. And um, so writing is kind of moving beyond that and um, yeah, trying to push past those kind of backward looking feelings. And we, I know we have to be informed by the past to then what we do you know but to then action ourselves into into the future and i think writing is a constant um grappling with that and a grapple to like understand and to create you know promote greater understanding of like this you know the crisis that we're part of without you know blaming and shaming and um not just like not just pressure on the individual either as you said um putting pressure on you know governments and I was just thinking in terms of writing about local food because it's such a complicated, like, you know, there's so many, infra so much infrastructure that complicates, you know, things for, you know, for people. Because even in terms of like promoting local food and eat local, support your local growers and farmers, but then there might be artisan kind of like butchers or bakers that are only open at a certain time, but the supermarket's open 24 hours. So it's like, you can't, how can you compete with that when, you know, some people work long hours and are pushed for time. So if you put the blame onto, you know, again, that word blame, if you put blame onto people like that, it's, it's making them feel powerless and overwhelmed, like you said before, you know, and it's, how can we, you know, push governments, if, if supermarkets, if we can't remove supermarkets, but could we stock, can we get supermarkets to support more local stockists, you know, it's things like that, it's that we don't have to take on the full responsibility ourselves, but we need to know how to direct, you know, those feelings, and it's it is a lot. It's so much. It's a lot to think about. But I think as writers, we can encourage people to think in ways that is, you know, beneficial to, you know, their their sense of self on the planet. I think. I think as um, another useful word apart from blame is cause and consequence. 
you know, we have to think about cause and consequence. This is at the heart of the climate crisis. A cause is going to lead to a consequence. You know, if you put sewage in the sea, obviously it's going to have a massively detrimental effect. And we, and we as individuals can think of every action we take and, you know, are we going to recycle these bottles at the end of the day? Or are we going to chuck them on the pavement? You know, cause and consequence. But another point I'd flag up is absolutely the, it's so important to understand that things are systemic, you know, that it's political. This is a political issue. And as much as we as individuals can make change, the government has to be accountable. What do you write? Are you a poet or a... Okay. When I started, I was really angry. I didn't write about climate, but I had a lot of anger, and I wrote about women's issues, and 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 I remember writing a script, which it's really relentless. It's never got made, but it got me my agent, and um, because there was there was so much pain in it, and I think you have to just it's great, use it. It's really good, powerful tool you've got. Take it and run with it. I guess like, I wrote like an intersectional eco-critical PhD. I'm really interested in that. Um, and I wondered what the panel had to say about kind of... So for me, in a way, like what, for example, queer writing has always been trying to do is to confront an idea of nature, which has been wielded against a minoritised population in the sense of like calling certain acts unnatural, right? Or certain genders. Um, but I wonder then if, if, that, if you see the other side of that, if in a sense we feel like nature writing or writing through the climate crisis now has an obligation to confront the way that race has been like, or um, has been like naturalised, like certain ideas of whiteness have been naturalised as, as more natural, as superior, or, or the way that gender has been kind of constituted through our ideas of nature. Like, like if we're writing about the climate crisis, is that an imperative too to, to confront these broader systems which are like totally intersect with or does that feel like like too much of a task you know like is that something that comes into your writing I think it I think it's really important I think climate change puts such pressure on society that groups that have been discriminated against in the past you know when the resources are tighter that that can only intensify and it's I think publishing is trying to tackle you know issues of diversity and and looking for different voices um, and I think for for writing about place and climate, it's ever more important. And I think, you know, it goes on. We need, you know, we, we need lots of different voices, don't we? We need lots more working class voices. We need lots more vo nor northern voices. You know, there are lots of issues around people with disability and how they um, experience and get into nature. I think nature in cities. I think, was it you, Anita, who talked about urban nature? Um, I think, yeah, I think this is one of the kind of subject areas, if we're not going to call it a genre, where um, those issues are, like, you know, we really need to magnify down and make sure that we're representing as many people as possible. And I think what you can do as a writer, you, you use your own voice, but you also, you're very aware of your community and you help amplify other voices as well. And yeah, reading, um, yeah, lots of different people's work. It's a really excellent point, you know, you've made and you made before in terms of kind of what you're seeing as nat natural as kind of a prescriptive kind of with a moral kind of like lauding to it how that's been used so unhelpfully you know over centuries you know that like this is not this is the natural way this is the not natural way but so much we by that argument so much we have done as like humans in society is unnatural you know like um in industry you know like the industrialization roads you know even like when you look at rivers and you think that's a natural body of water but it's been channeled and bashed around and it's that I think again, like I said before, language can be so limiting and so, and I think, but also like it's a great tool for exploration and questioning itself, you know, questioning itself. And I think, yeah, by constantly questioning what we regard as natural and seeing this human, I mean, I think it's easy to have the assumption that natural means like not, you know, other than human or, but it's, but it, we're all part of the same entity. So it's, um, coming to terms with exploring that and it might mean cracking open the language terms that we've used in the past and analysing them and not being frightened to you know confront that. I think confrontation is a big element and it can be constructive. Thank you for that. That was a great question. Yeah, I, I think it's such an important thing, isn't it? Because we have like uh, climate change is like feminism, I remember, you know, it gets hijacked by the Western worlds and, and they, they are telling you 
like I remember when climate change be started becoming a bigger and bigger issue and people were having a go at people, you know, people who are suffering the most at the moment towards the East. Um, I was thinking, but what about the West? We caused that. Why aren't we putting our hands up and dealing with it? Which is now, you know, one of the biggest things. Still nothing is being done. Everybody's talking about it. But it's a really important question and thing to think about. These earlier you were sort of alluding to the role a lot of what you've been talking about is it feels like it's based on kind of the individual experience with place and nature but I think as it was kind of alluded to earlier actually it's such a big problem and as an individual we can try and do all the right things but it doesn't feel like it will make that much of an impact so how do you balance that in your writing to sort of address the much bigger wider issues that the sort of everyday like we might just feel powerless about. Yeah, well. so it was such an important question yeah, about sorry. the, you know, what is natural and what is unnatural. You know, could, I think it's, it's such an important question. It's at the heart of my book, I Belong Here, because I was told that I'm not, nat I'm unnatural because I've got brown skin. And also, you know, it's a question, as you, it's a question of gender, of race, of sexuality. And um, though it's so important that people from marginalised backgrounds have the right to write and mm -hmm. overturn con concepts of what is natural and and who belongs here mm -hmm. yeah and also because i wanted to look at for example like the colors in nature to show that actually you only have to look at the black soil and the brown skin bark to see that those colors that i had been bullied about are actually <laughs> natural <laughs> yeah so um and in terms of your question yeah i don't think those wider issues in the individual are ne necessarily two separate things i mean the personal is political and the political is personal and I think that people forget that, that, you know, the wider issues are impacting our everyday, intimately personal lives, you know, like what, how much energy bills are, it's impacting us. So I think it's really important to put those two together and realise that actually you can write about the, you can write about those wider issues through writing something supposedly very personal because it will come through because the political impacts the personal and vice versa. Yeah, it's really hard to tackle everything, isn't it? And one, one thing I did is I got involved with this. The Society of Authors set up um, a, a sustainability working group and we started to look at books and the production of a book and how sustainable that can be. Um, and yeah, I felt like that was a way for me of um, using my energy to just do something good, just to, to like really focus in on something that I felt like I could have an impact on. Um, and it was led by Piers Torde, another children's writer. And it's kind of the group's kind of changed now and it's gone on and it's, it's progressing. But um, yeah, I think I've lost track of the question a little bit. So <laughs> um, but yes, I just think you, it, you, ca you, can, you can feel really like, apathetic. Like it's just too big a thing to tackle, but you have to find your way in. Um, and writing can help you do that, I think. I think, yeah, that's where you find your way in and you start there and then things spiral out from that. Yeah, like writing and thinking, as you say, is that vehicle for kind of starting to approach that enormous kind of looming kind of, it's, it's terrifying and it feels overwhelming. How can you possibly express that? But like things start spiraling, as you say, you can hold an orange in your hand in the supermarket. And that is like a symptom of the, you know, it can be, as much as it's a nice orange, it's a symptom of the whole problem. It's created out of season. We've come to accept what is natural as no, it's not natural. It's not natural, not in that sense, you know. So we come back to the use of the word natural again. And um, it's by just, I think, having an open mind and thinking beyond the immediate present, you know, um, um, among, uh, beyond the facade, you know, beyond like the nicely cultivated garden. And we think nature, you know, like we see nature as something else. And it's kind of thinking under it. And I think by just opening th our thoughts and talking about it and, you know, channeling the emotions that rise into activism, I think that's a real route to kind of, you know, whether that right activism is writing or if it's putting pressure on the government or if it, you know, in whatever way is meaningful to you, you have to, it's, we're all on an individual journey, but together. So it's, I think it's coming to terms with it in, you know, a way that is meaningful to you, but it is, it is really difficult. Right. I hope you got an answer there. Did that help you? Yeah, I think it's like starting at a macro level or a micro level. I, you know, it's, it's very personal, isn't it? So, um, well, I think we are out of time. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much, all of you. Amazing, amazing answers. And thank you all for being here and so attentive.